which is uh, why do we why do data audits to begin with, right? So data audits are what I think in terms of you know life in general. You get out what you put in, right? And data audits help make sure that you're putting the data in correctly so that you can get the data back out. So if I had to turn this into a sort of a PSA flip, it would be uh, PSA is simple. You get out what you put in, so to speak. And uh, I do have to get credit. I pulled this from the inspirational quotes about life.net, <clears throat> uh, this, this graphic from it. Um, but, but the data audits are, are really a necessity uh, because there's nothing more frustrating than running a report, getting your forecast out of the system, understanding resource availability, and then finding out the data is not reliable. And how could I have prevented that? How could I be more proactive in making sure the data is correct? Because you can't, you know, without any kind of proactive action, you can't assume that the data is uh, going to be good to go. Yeah. So uh, if you need a reason to do data auditing, other than the fact that there's the auditors, which you'll see I have it's the very last thing. Of course, you have to be able to audit your own data. Uh, for me, it's uh, the reason that you want to do data auditing is about process and policy compliance, first and foremost. Uh, you're running your business. You have a business model. You've defined ownership, handoff, uh, best practices even within your own organization, and you need a way to make sure that people are actually following it. Um, nothing militaristic or um, militaristic, uh, but you really want to make sure people are following those pro policies and, po and, and processes. Uh, there's nothing worse than, than getting a project profitability report and find out that three of the team haven't even put their timesheets in yet or submitted their expense reports because now you're not only getting part of the picture. Right? The other reason is really the data accuracy and completeness. Right? If you don't have completely tagged data, if you're, you added these variables into the, into the system for you to be able to pull information based on interesting uh, slices and dices, you know, like uh, the industry and the, the priority of the project and the size of the project and what type of contract it is and so forth. If you're not setting those values, then pulling reports using those values to group information or to segregate information become also worthless because now you're tracking information that's not reliable. So we do want to make sure that there's something in place that's making sure that what you're tracking is useful. And if you're tra trying to track too much, what can you, you know, pull back from? What can you remove uh, from the, the list of values that you're having to set up? Because it will save you a lot of time just in general. The other reason, of course, is the whole change management and adoption. This, this sort of goes with the policy and procedure uh, compliance thing. But really, change Change is hard. Change management and adoption need something to understand if people are doing what you have expected them to do and um, adopting the change. So that's another reason I think audits are important. Uh, again, it sort of supports the other two, but it's another aspect of what happens in your business as things change over time, as your business evolves over time, as you, you get acquired or your company acquires somebody, change is going to happen, and how do you make sure you get that word out and that people have you know, taken the course and are exhibiting the behavior that you need them to exhibit uh, in the system. Of course, system maintenance is always another thing. We, we typically have like annual webinars series actually on, hey, get ready for the next year. You know, here's the things that you need to be doing in your tool, setting up the holidays in the calendar and making sure cost rates are updated with uh, any kind of salary adjustments, all those kind of things. Uh, so system maintenance becomes uh, also data maintenance, and uh, system maintenance becomes uh, cleaning up things that are just no longer relevant. Um, yeah, a great example is reporting. You know, reports are something that in many PSAs you can just sort of create on the fly, and that may be a report that's useful for many, many months to come. It may have been a one-and-done situation, but now you've saved it, and it's it's sort of like you know collecting stuff in the junk drawer. Eventually, it's gonna. There's too much stuff in the junk drawer, so you should probably clean that junk drawer out and throw away the stuff that you don't need anymore. Okay. And then finally, of course, is the auditors. So being able to prove to them that you are following, you know, your your SOX uh, procedures, that you are 
making sure that you are being truthful and tracking information according to price lists and, and all those you know, controls that are in place uh, from a business perspective, business practice perspective, and how can you support those uh, queries and those uh, questions from the data that you're tracking in your system. And if you're keeping the data clean in your system, then that's a, a fairly straightforward data pull uh, out of the tool. Okay. So, so if you need a reason, of course, these are all things that probably resonate with each and one of, every one of you. you know, yep, 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 that's what I need to do, audit. Uh, Jody, get on with it. Okay. So, so what I thought I would do is I would take each of these components and talk about what I've seen uh, and then what I've worked with customers on, what I do also within Top Step as a way to do data audits and, and make the PSA tool work for me but I also put things back into the tool to make sure the tool can work for me, you know, sort of getting out what I put into it. So let's start with process and policy compliance. You know, this is the <laughs> one where like, all right, all right, we get it. You need my timesheet and you need it by Monday morning or Saturday afternoon or whatever your controls are in the system, okay? And timesheets are an easy one to pick on because a lot of people in your organization are using the PSA for timesheets. Uh, and that's the easy one that, you know, you have guidelines in place because you're expecting to understand actuals versus plan, quite honestly. Okay. So, so what are the popular policy metrics that I see uh, in working with customers and working, you know, within the industry? Of course, the timesheet's number one. You know, that one's an easy one to measure. First off, do you have your timesheet in the system? Did you submit it on time? Did the, the, your, your, the person who's approving it, um, that's responsible for reviewing it, did they approve it in the timeline? You know, this may sound familiar. Your timesheet is due Sunday night. Approvers have to have it done and approved by Monday afternoon. Uh, you will get notified if you are one day late by Tuesday morning. You get another notice by Wednesday morning. Approvers get, are getting notices if they're one day late or two days late. Uh, and after that, um, you know, people come after you, I guess. <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, but that's a pretty, poly, a pretty common compliance measure. Uh, a lot of PSA tools have the ability to not only measure the fact whether you have a timesheet or not, but they also have this timeline aspect to it so that you can see if you're compliant or not. Uh, the fact that you get your timesheet in finally from three months ago does not mean you're compliant. It just means that you finally remember to get your timesheet in and there should be something that, um, you know, impacts you as well as because you've impacted the company on that compliance. Uh, another popular one I see is really this, this comes to sort of the cash flow of the company, right? And I, I do completely agree with this one. Uh, make it, making sure that expenses are submitted within some kind of aging window uh, in order to get reimbursements. Uh, so things like uh, I took a trip and I'm sitting there and I'm doing my expense report. I have to make sure I put my expense report in within some type of reasonable timeline. You know, 45 days is a pretty common number I hear when I work with customers. Um, I personally look for my team to submit things on a monthly basis at a minimum uh, because that will, you know, will reimburse them as soon as they submit it. But if they want to wait, then I need to know on a, at least on a monthly basis. Uh, I, ha I have run into the past, run into customers where they allow people to do it like once every six months. Uh, for a company, that's, to me, that's a big cash flow hit all of a sudden, and the opportunity lost to rebill all that expenses if it was billable expenses, right? So, so making sure there's some kind of aging window compliance uh, for expense reports. And the last one is, is not really a policy compliance. It's more of a process compliance. So this is really just to kind of get you thinking about what, what do I mean by doing data audits? What kind of data audits should I be thinking about? So this one regarding the projects in the right life cycle is, hey, the project's sitting here in the proposal stage or the pending stage, and I notice that there's time on it, okay, which means it started. So shouldn't it be in the at-risk stage, or did we actually get the signed paperwork? Shouldn't it be in the active or the live stage? Because that impacts probably the way that the reporting is being done, the way that the, the project information would get picked up when it comes to things like billing, when it comes to the things like forecasting and actuals and metrics, right? So, so you, if you have your PSA set up to track information a certain way, you definitely want to make sure those, the, you know, the, the procedures that you have, the processes you have in place are being followed. Otherwise, the reports you get are going to be worthless. Why did you bother putting all that detail in the tool uh, if you're not going to leverage it? Okay, so the 
right life cycle, right stage, based on simple things like if there's time on it, it's probably live, or at least at risk at a minimum, we need to understand what the contract terms are. Now, oh, and ensuring resources are set up with proper controls. So this one is, isn't really process policy, it's more con, uh, permission based when I think of um, ensuring resources are set up correctly. So this comes down to things like an employee versus a subcontractor. Uh, and in many tools that you uh, have on the marketplace, you get access to the system, but you may not get access to all of the system because you as a person are only allowed to see stuff that relates to you, for example. Or if you're a contractor, you're only allowed to see the projects that you are specifically working on. You can't see the entire customer base of the vendor that you're providing services for because now you're, you know, you're getting inside information. So those kind of proper controls, making sure that people are set up according to um, what they should be allowed to see and running audits frequently to make sure users are set up correctly. Uh, with those controls would be a good uh, process and policy uh, compliance measure. Now the data accuracy and completeness, this may be you know, a, a fairly obvious topic, but, but really it, it comes down to our, you know, when we're setting up data, um, there, I see sort of two schools of thought. One is what's the minimum number of things I can do on the, on the project, for example, to set it up and get it going right away. Like what, what's my minimum, right? And then there's the other school of thought, which is if there's a field there, I'm going to fill it out whether I know how to fill it out or not. Okay, so so that that kind of both of those fall into this category. And in the case of you know making sure that you're setting up the project fully and making sure the data data is complete and accurate, um, there are also things that people may track outside of the tool. And you know, some, like you know, tracking a project is coming or something from pipeline and the PSA tool doesn't know anything about it, so how can you do any kind of early planning? So the more that you're, you're, the more of the data that you're missing in the tool, more of the data that you're not tracking in the tool actually weakens the ability for the tool to do a job completely, right? So, so here are things that I, I think about as far as audits to make sure the data is accurate, that the data is complete, but also you can actually use them as metrics as well. So a pretty common one is a plan versus actual for resource scheduling. So how accurate am I in planning out my resource needs how, you know, versus the actuals? Uh, this shows not only the accuracy of resource scheduling, but it also prevents the resource hoarding phenomenon that may happen in your organization. I'm going to grab these five people. I'm going to say I need these five people. But in actuality, they're only working 10% of the time. The other 90%, they're, they're charging beach or bench, you know, which is a huge opportunity loss for your company. And of course, now you're in, incurring cost without, um, without benefit of billing. And the whole reason that the PM did that was the project's going to start, the project's going to start, the project's going to start. It's delayed, it's delayed, it's delayed. They don't want to lose the team. Totally understand that. But also the company is also starting to hurt because of that. So plan versus actual to make sure your resource scheduling is accurate helps to give you faith in your forecast, but also helps you fight sort of process, you know, and behavior issues that may be causing problems in trying to get people billable up to their utilization. Okay. Um, making sure your project setup is complete, right? So you're setting up the project according to the SOW, right? And making sure that your task structure reflects your SOW because the more aligned that is, the easier it is for you to provide status back to the, to the customer. If you start tracking your full SOW scope outside of OpenAir and you're just using OpenAir or Financial Force or Kimball or any other PSA system, if you're using your PSA system as simply an hours gathering, you're missing an opportunity to be able to pull information very easily from the PSA and, and, and uh, just send that to the customer. You're having to pull information from the PSA and now align it to the spreadsheet that you're doing, and then it, you're spending lots of time with that. Um, the other thing you can do is also in many of the PSA tools, you can actually do baselining. So the baselining functionality could be a cost baseline, hours baseline, schedule baseline, whatever. Uh, you basically take a baseline when you set it up, so at least you have something to go back to to say, so here's what our plan was originally, how well did we do against the plan? So the, 
that that audit to make sure the baseline is there, make sure that you have that, you know, that historical review, that historical uh, compare available, which then just feeds back into things like, you know, getting better at estimation, getting better at anticipating scheduling, things like that. And then, of course, making sure that whatever you've set up as far as financial controls on the on the project are accurate. So. Uh, many times you may be copying templates or reusing standard price cards or price lists, and those are not actually what's in the SOW. So you don't catch it, the invoice goes out, and the worst thing is that the customer says, you're charging me too much. We negotiated these rates. Why am I getting charged that? So these audits are also a benefit to you, so it would reduce invoice corrections and making sure that you know, you're paying attention to forecast, which could be a, viewed as an audit almost in this category, uh, but you're making sure that the bill rates are accurate as well. So change management and adoption for me, um, change is hard, uh, and I recognize change is hard. Uh, I think delegating change is harder. So you, trying to change yourself, there's a discipline you can apply to yourself, you can sort of understand the benefit of why you want to change. That's why diet programs are so popular, right? But then asking someone else to change, that's almost harder because you're trying to uh, point out the benefit to that person, point out the, the usability for that person. So change is hard, and delegating change is harder in my point of view. So really what you need to do is to help make change happen is you have to adopt measures to understand what is changing from measures, and measures are essentially audits. So how is, you know, we, we changed our policy for timesheet compliance. I'll keep using timesheets because it's an easy one to pick on. Uh, we changed our policy from Monday morning to Friday night. So our, how, how compliant are people or how adaptable have people become adopting that change? And so you start measuring those types of, uh, those types of measures. Uh, so a, a, the trigger of when to set up a, an adoption audit is when you hear the sentence, starting on this date, we will be doing blah, blah, blah. Right? There's got to be something that you can start measuring to make sure that people know after that date, we'll be checking to see if you're doing it. Okay? So that if somebody just says, we'll do it, and you don't follow through, um, then you'll never know if the adoption actually happened. Uh, also highlighting any kind of metrics for improvement. So we need to get our timesheet compliance to be 99%. And so the reason that we are changing our, our due date from Monday mornings to Friday nights is people are typically wrapping up their day and they are fresh in their mind of time. So therefore we are asking you as of the 15th of, of March to start putting your timesheets in and getting them in on Friday night, right? So that we can see if that impacts the timesheet compliance. So, so now you're doing a kind of cause and effect audit, and you're trying to, you're hitting a target and you're using the audits to understand if we're getting close and if we're driving the behavior that we want. Okay. And really learn from the data. Don't run, it, don't run a report just to run a report. Uh, don't do the audit just to do an audit and check a box. Look at the data and make, it, make sure it's consumable. Uh, so that you can take action on it. Because if it's not, if the audit is showing that the adoption is not happening or the behavior change that you expected to see is not happening, then what kind of corrective action do you need? And also keep in mind, change takes time. So the minute you announce something, two days later it may not be, be followed. Give it time to sort of be adopted. Now system maintenance, this is one of my favorite slides. Uh, so system maintenance, System maintenance is really meant to be a time and cost savings, but um, maintenance takes time. Maintenance is an administrative activity, you know, it's something that we work with customers on uh, as well. So we, you will actually recognize time and cost savings because you won't be spending so much time verifying that the data is actually right. That's what the whole audit process is supposed to be for. Okay? Um, so things like doing maintenance on the users that have licenses to your PSA solution. The more of those that you can free up, the more cost savings you have because you don't keep having to buy licenses. Like how are you going to manage that license use in the tool? Getting rid of all those reports that are just no longer valid. Um, I don't know how many of you can resonate with this, but in any PSA tool, people have their core 5, 10, 15 reports. I've 
logged in and worked with customers in their PSA solution, and I kid you not, I see like a thousand reports, and I have, I'm like, they can't all, they can't be using a thousand reports, and I look, and sure enough, about 990 of them haven't been run in six months, right? And to me, that's an indicator that they were useful at one time, but they're not useful now, and now they're just noise, and you're trying to find a certain report and you do a keyword search and you're like, give me backlog and you get 17 copies of the backlog report and you have to check and see, well, which one is right? Now I'm just wasting time doing that, right? Trying to find that information out. Get rid of the stuff that you don't need. Keep it, keep it clean, right? And then there's all that customization. We did an earlier webinar this year on customization. So things to watch out for, things to add, you know, what's going to be a benefit, what's going to be a distraction, right? And uh, one of my favorite customizations uh, is when you have um, a field that is a default value, okay? And I, I talked about in the last slide, like people being able to, wanting to set up projects very quickly, so they'll set up a minimum number of fields. So that's the reason you have defaults, right? The defaults is sort of an easy way to sort of set values up. So a, a pretty happy one that I see is, you know, project health or project risk or something, and it's that green, yellow, red, right? And I think in terms of M&Ms, it's the green, yellow, red drop down, and it's always defaulted to green, okay? And when I run a report in those systems, inevitably, magically, every single project is green, okay? Because there's a default, and, and there's no real drive to change the value. That's where the auditability comes in to say, you know, are, we, are these projects all really green? If we're not going to use this field, let's not use the field. Let's get rid of it. If we're going to use the field, then we have to change behavior and they have to maintain this and make sure the data is being kept up to date. Right? So you're looking for fields that have defaults that are never changed from the default value. You're looking for fields that have values that are never used. Right? So nothing first than having a drop down of 25 things and you're only using three of them because the rest of them are just old, old information. Okay, finding ways to, to work around that and make sure the list is a useful list. And then also fields that are just not used. Um, in my example of people fill out the minimum what they need to set up a project and save it and keep going, um, if you find about 90% of the time this one value is not being populated because it's not required, um, then, and no one's caught it for a number of months, let's add that caveat, then is it really that useful? Because if it's useful, we should have caught it six months ago. There should be reports dependent on it. If it's not useful, get rid of it. Right. And finally, our friends, the auditors. Right. These are our frontenies. Uh, they're the people that help keep us on our toes and make sure that we actually are following what it is that we put in place because what we put in place is supposed to help us be better at everything that we do. And so the auditors are double checking, make sure we're tracking accounting uh, correctly and following business processes. So I always look at it as they're actually your friend and they're really doing data audits to benefit you as a whole, as a company. Um, so make sure you understand how your PSA can support their audit needs. Uh, most of the PSAs have some kind of audit trail uh, and the audit trails know things like what changed, when was it created, uh, and who did it, right? The only, other, the only thing an audit trail in a, in a tool can't do is understand why. Why did you do it? And at the end of the day, the why comes back to what is your process? <laughs> what is, you know, how are you keeping your data accurate? How, what kind of change are you adopting? So it kind of brings you back full circle from a data auditor perspective to make sure that the processes and policies you're putting in place are actually something that are supported by doing your data audits. Okay. So before I wrap it up and, and uh, answer some questions uh, from, the, from the attendees here, uh, just know, I mean, just like anything, a tool will only provide information that you put into it and you keep maintained in the system. Um, maintenance is something that takes time to do, but it actually saves time on the back end. So the more you do up front, the less you have to double check and triple check and, and re-verify at the end. Uh, making sure you set those audits up, you're doing them on a regular basis, and you're checking things change, things evolve, your company evolves over time, you're going to add things, you should also subtract things from your configuration of your PSA and make sure that whatever you're tracking is something that's going to be useful. 
okay? Uh, keep your system clean, right? And, it, and it's hard to do that. It's very subjective when I say keep your system clean. It's very subjective, uh, but you know, resource management is a big one. Timesheet compliance is a big one. Making sure projects are being tracked with the right data is a big one because all of that factors into reporting and accuracy of running your business. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and stop.